We're live. <laughs> Welcome to Coffee with the Writer. This time we are meeting with Elizabeth Arnold, a poet who lives in Frostburg. Yay. <laughs> um, I'm Nina Forsyth, uh, your uh, host. And Jen Brown is here, who is the director of the Center for the Literary Arts at Frostburg State University. Um, before I introduce Elizabeth, Jen, would you uh, thank all the sponsors of this event? <laughs> I would be really happy to. So the, the work of the Center for Literary Arts is sponsored this semester by the Allegheny Arts Council, by the Community Trust Foundation, by the City of Frostburg, by um, several offices at Frostburg State University, including the Office of the President, the Office of the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and also by the English Department, um, Department of English and Foreign Languages and Literature. This semester, our work is also being supported by the Lewis J. Ort Library and also the Department of Biology at Frostburg State University. So uh, cool. we have lots of community coming together to support our work. But most importantly, what we do yeah. is made possible by you. And so we're grateful you are along with us this morning. Yes, thank you all. And we are very grateful for all the sponsors and all the participants in this. And we're grateful to Elizabeth and our many other writers who join us for these coffees. Um, so Elizabeth, is a poet. She has five books of poetry. The most recent is Skeleton Coast, which I'm really interested in hearing her talk about. I don't know if that's what you're <laughs> going to uh, read from uh, Elizabeth, but here's just a little bit of a hint <laughs> for what I'd like. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth also has lots of awards and fellowships, including an Amy Lowell Traveling Grant, a Whiting Writers Award, She's got Yotto and McDowell Fellowships and many, many others, <laughs> too numerous to list. Her poems have appeared in poetry, which I'm very envious of, <laughs> the Paris Review, Plowshares, Slate, The Nation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, while researching um, Mina Loy for her doctoral dissertation, she discovered Loy's lost, lost novel, Incel, which she edited for Black Sparrow Press, which that is really cool, a cool discovery. And she teaches in the MFA program at the University of Maryland. And as I said, lives here in Frostburg. And we're really happy to have her in our community. Um, we're growing a community of writers here. Rob just says that uh, the live stream is like a half second delayed from oh, no. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he's in the other room. <laughs> I hope it doesn't cause problems for anybody else on this. <laughs> so um, Liz, could you start um, with just by reading whatever you have selected to read for us to give everybody like a flavor um, of your writing? Okay, definitely. Um, yeah, the Skeleton Coast. Uh, do you know where Skeleton Coast is in Namibia? Like the, the Atlantic coast of Africa. Namibia, uh, yeah, Namibia. South, South Africa. Yeah, it's a very, very remote desert-like area. But maybe I'll, I'll read something from it later. Um, okay. I did this, I just this, I, I started with that Amy Lowell travel grant and then I got, I went to Egypt and I, I actually fell in love <laughs> in Egypt. So I kept going wow. back and then that kind of exploded. And uh -huh. I, I really, I, but I was learning more and more about, um, about uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So I really wanted to go. And I knew somebody who lived in Nairobi. So I started, you know, there. And then I think there was something about, it wasn't, it wasn't the pandemic. There was, oh, a yellow fever. I couldn't get a yellow fever vaccine. Mm. So I couldn't go there at first. I had to go. And so that's what, how I ended up in Namibia. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was looking for this person. I was looking for another, another version of this person. You know how that happens after you yes, yeah. lose a love. Um, but, um, but it was, quite amazing. And I just, I did that for, I don't know, a couple of years. Um, but I, I'm going to start with a really early poem. I think it might be the earliest poem in any of my books. And um, I wrote it, um, it was right when I was starting to write again, after, when I was in Chicago, I, I got my PhD there. And I, I was there for a long, long, many, many years. And I was living and uh, I was, I was renting my dissertation advisor's house because he was in Germany on this thing for a year. And um, I remember I, the house was just sort of, for me, it was kind of um, 
I don't know, it was, it was blessed is the wrong word. It was, it was, it was somehow charged, you know, uh, cause all of his books were there and everything. Uh. And I was working in his office and all that stuff. So I, 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 this is, this rarely, rarely, rarely happens. And I did revise it some, but it almost came out whole from a dream. Wow. And it was one of those magical things. So um, now I'm saying too much about it. <laughs> you might not like it. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to read it. Um, it. It has, I can't remember what its title was. It has, I, I took all the titles off of my first book and made it a book length sequence. Um, there was kind of a sequence in the middle there were regular poems on either side, and then the middle just swallowed up all the other ones. So, <laughs> like, so this one, um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name. It's okay. It's okay. It was no time. It was in a dream that in time won in spite of love and let love go. No scream broke the long glide home, or so we thought it, the car gone out of control. We sat there quiet, waiting, my sister and I, while the car bombed through the air over the embankment, it took forever. It was a place to talk. We spoke freely and with point, though we had fought 10 years apart. I told her there what I had always wished to say, but had not known, and she could hear. But when we did not die, the car crashing anyway, and everything we'd found to say again was lost. Her face was set and we stood looking at the wreck. Mm. So I don't know, uh, you know, it's, um, I still have a problem with this sister <laughs> going on, <laughs> but you know, um, say la vie. Um, but I think it's about more than just that. You know, I think mm -hmm. there's something, I mean, I haven't really looked at this poem in a long time. There's something about the ending, um, but when we did not die. Um, and then the fact that her face was set kind of like, you know, the face of a corpse or something, you know, she, she's kind of, uh -huh. you know, I was talking about love before. And it's always, I remember the first time I lost a love and it was like, it was like a death. It was like mourning a death. And I, and I remember thinking it was like a light switch going off, you know, it was sort of, it was so automatic, so absolute. And um, I think it's the closest thing, maybe one of the closest things. I'm sure there are other things, but to. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a grief that follows yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. There's also this kind of exhilaration. I mean, I'm talking about my own poem, <laughs> exactly. yeah, yeah, examining my own poem, but the um, the car bombing through the air. There's something kind of huge that line really grabbed me. Big yeah. about that, you know. It's like the only, you know. I, I talk to my students about verbs being packed with meaning. You know, to have a verb with a lot of meaning, and then also mm -hmm. have it be one syllable and lots of hard hard consonants. It really has uh -huh. this punch, you know. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think it's the only word like that in the whole poem. It's interesting how it just it's and it's at the end of a line. You can't see the poem, but it's at the end mm -hmm. of a line. And um, I wish I could do that. I, I'm not good at that. Um, sorry, sharing uh, sharing screens, but it um, it does stand at the end of the line. It, there's something about it. Just, it's the longest line of the poem too. Uh, so yeah, it really emphasizes that. that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something about that. The exhil exhilaration um, mm -hmm. somehow braided into death. You know, possibly dying. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, something it seems though that you can get at in a dream or in yeah. like a hypothetical that you get, that you do in fiction and poetry that that you can capture that. That it all comes together. All these things are connected. Just yeah. Nat seemingly naturally, organically, something your logical mind might not have come up with. Probably would not have. <laughs> right, you're right. Yes. <laughs> I always tell my, I'm sorry, talking talk about students so much, but I always tell my students that um, I'm about to retire. So I'm thinking a lot about my students uh, lately, more than usual. And uh, I'm not teaching right now, but I, um, I always feel like there's this kind of river that's just flowing all the time. It's our subconscious, I guess, but it's always there. And I tell them, you know, you don't have much time in the day, but just take 10 minutes mm -hmm. and dip into that river, you know, just even if it's just staring out a window for a while, you know, mm -hmm. just kind of dipping into it. Um, 
uh, it's always there. It's always happening. And I think this, I think this was kind of a, a situation where it just came out, you know, I was sleeping, which is when we're all in, we're in that river. <laughs> that is interesting that you say that. In the river. <laughs> because I have oh, noticed, <laughs> I've noticed in a lot of your work, you use words like flow and river. This is like a constant metaphor with you, isn't it? It, you know, I grew up on a three mile wide river in Florida and oh. my house was on it. I, when I, I woke up in the morning, the, the ripples from the river and the sunlight were on my wall. They were oh, cool. on yes. the wall. So yeah. <laughs> like I was in it. <laughs> I was in it, but it was light. Oh my God. That, yeah. That's so cool. that, it's in that, that image is in a poem, I think um, somewhere, but um, yeah, yeah. That's, it, it's huge, a huge, huge part of my life. Yeah. So you so see it in a lot of things. Huh? You see it in a lot of things. That's that's sort of like the connection that you make with things, uh, it, it, or this. or a way of making a connection. Watch well, a connection yeah. is another thing, or lack of connection seems to be okay. something. Okay, well, <laughs> find this poem. Um, you're making me think of a poem. Well, it's it's funny. It's right. No, that's not the one. There's a, a long poem in this book about this guy. It's about this guy in Egypt, um, lo- like water flowing. The Nile, you know, it's on the Nile. It's the Nile. Uh-huh. But that was a thing. And um, it's actually, it's a new poem. It's a new poem. I'm still thinking about that. Let me find it. Um, sure. Let's see, it's right here. I think it's, I wasn't planning to read it, but it's, um, give me a second here. Um, this new, my new book is kind of about home and feeling sort of disconnected from home and all this traveling I've been doing. And so this is, um, I was in Egypt uh, during the first, the first revolution, the first revolution, you know, back in 2010, I was there. Mm -hmm. And luckily I was not in Cairo, Uh, I was way down South. Mm -hmm. And and that's what this this poem is set during that time. Okay, so I'm gonna read this. It's like, it's um, it's a teeny bit longer than the other one, but it's not that long and it's very narrative. So I think you can follow it. I thought it might be home. There's a river in it. A man with a big earthy family, unlike mine. When it was starting, us looking through one of the glassless windows at the Sahara, the Nile's muscular curves out of sight behind us. Me asking, what's this? What's that? Such as the one room round topped mud colored building halfway up a dune, so high, so huge. It made the forever blue sky there seem small. He answered the police. Mubarak's, I was in the Middle East. The internet cut for all of Egypt hours before as more than a thousand citizens were on their way to being killed in Cairo while we stood together falling in love. By the next day, there were tanks in the streets of Aswan, a plain clothes government guy young, appearing from behind some kind of armored personnel carrier, military kind of truck, waved me away from the souk. I had taken the ferry on the hunt for news, but no papers were coming in. And who knows who got arrested where I was headed, got murdered. I saw smashed windows, a street light at an angle. His arm around my shoulder, he went on, were being watched but I didn't feel fear. The engine cut, we glided on the water. Mm. So um, if it, I thought it might be home. There's a river in it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that was a, that river. Oh my God, that river was much more. My river was kind of tidal and you know flat, almost like a lake, but this river, the Nile, oh wow unbelievably powerful and moving and you just know how big it is you know and just oh uh-huh so you, it was closer to the source right where you were i was um uh, the uh, the source is way down way, so way even down farther down. uganda yeah. <laughs> you know, it's way uh-huh. down. so i but i was in the southern part of egypt they call it um i think they call it i forget the, the cataract anyway there, there was a place it's a place where there were there were rapids so the so like the Greeks and everybody could go no further down. They could go, they couldn't take the river any farther. Mm-hmm. And so now there's a dam and there's a giant 
you know, like it's awful because it really um, covered up a lot of uh, ruins, a lot of amazing Nubian ruins. Um, but anyway, it, it, it's so sometimes I have another uh, poem about how they they turn on and off the water, you know, but um, uh -huh. but usually you can't tell. Yeah. <laughs> Did you want to read another poem that uh, like a. Uh... I don't know. Do you want to read something from Skeleton Coast? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can. I can switch to Skeleton Coast. Do you want to make? Uh, maybe. A, maybe. Um, a, is there one that you want me to read, or are you thinking a type of poem? No. I, well, I think uh, for the sake of everybody tuning in, perhaps you could talk a little bit about the Skeleton Coast and kind of what drew you to that as, um, like the central organizing. Um, metaphor for the whole thing. you know not just yeah. metaphor because it is you know a real place in your poems but uh yeah yeah um well well that's a that's a hard question but i can <laughs> i can i can say i'm just trying to think um i don't know how much i've thought about it recently um but um not at all um but anyway i <laughs> you're already on to the next thing i think i was already um I'd already fallen in love with the desert because I was in the Sahara. I went, I even went out way out to um, Siwa, which is almost to Libya. And that was a very moving experience. Mm -hmm. And I spent the night in the desert, you know? And so it was really, really, so I think that in, in, in Namibia, the whole country is a desert basically. It's, um, but the desert is so varied. There's so much, there's so many different kinds of deserts, you know, um, uh -huh. and um, there's plenty of wildlife, you know, uh, that, that have adapted to it. Um, and they're plants that, that live on the, they, they, they wait for the fog. They, there's no water except for in fog. <laughs> you know, so they, wow. that's how they survive. They get watered by fog you know, yeah, uh, just coming off the ocean. So it's uh, where I was, was pretty far inland, but we did go out to the coast and it's called Skeleton Coast because um, it's a really, really difficult, uh, tide, uh, difficult sort of current wise uh, ocean and constantly ships were um, hitting, you know, hitting sandbars and, you know, and people, people died. Um, a lot of wrecks. Yeah, a lot of wrecks. I mean, I have one poem that just describes, describes it. I can read that. Um, it's, um, I'm not, I'm not telling you about the metaphor yet. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it'll, hopefully it'll happen. Um, but um, we'll see if I can find this. There's this one poem. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so this just describes it. It's just kind of a descriptive poem. Mm -hmm. um, there may be more to it than that. Maybe it'll lead us to uh, the, the answer to the question. <laughs> um, this is part of a sequence of poems that are about, the, about this place. Um, so it doesn't have a title. Out at the coast, ship carcasses teeter or sand heavy at their centers, sunk, buckle. All that's left being rusted bones, the little bit of tackle still attached like wiry hairs, the bones of their past occupants bright against the dun, sorry, dun of the dunes. Nothing for a survivor to survive on after the fogs hid the shoreline from the ships. Nothing but dunes of a mind boggling variety of shapes, all just sand finally, lions hunting among them, while the tiny plants waiting for morning when the fog will grant them water of a measure smaller than drops. As the deep dunes multiply inland hundreds of miles before anyone could reach the green of Itosha's famous watering hole or one of the few minute ponds scattered around, no doubt no one found. So there's a kind of extremity to it yeah. um, that um, I'm drawn to for some reason. Um, uh, it's kind of a dark poem. One thing I was noticing is I was looking through, I was looking through my books, you know, and, and think, looking at these poems and every single one seems to have like a, like the, there's a fist in there. Uh, <laughs> wow, really hard in there. Huh. Um, I don't know. I it, it each one seems to want to encounter something that that you tend to avoid in waking life. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's our job as artists to sort of make people, you know, make people face things that are that are that are tugging at them under the surface but mm -hmm. that that they need to needs to be released um i feel like that's part of our job 
though sometimes we come at it slant. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's sometimes it's the only way. Um, yeah. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like like what, what the metaphor is, I'm still trying to figure that out. That's still slant for me. It's still a slanty slant. Um, this book um, was um, inspired, sort of at the heart of this book was uh, another, another man, <laughs> a really, uh, really um, <clears throat> venomous uh, kind of terrible experience that I had. And oh, wow. I, uh, with a sociopath, I got, I got involved with a sociopath. Um, and, 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 and when I figured it out, you know, it took about a year for me to, and, her, and his sister told me, I just really was pulled in. And um, it made me realize that things happening in my family were related. So the book is about sort of this guy, but also my family. And I, I can read one poem about my, this is about my, um, my mother. Um, it's in this poem and it has nothing to do with Skeleton Coast per se, but maybe something about the severity of that place um, and the struggle you know, that, that I went through. Um, with this person and how it was like a desert, like the person was lying to me with every breath. So there was no love there, you know, there was no, so it was like, it was like a desert as far as any kind of caring or empathy or, you know, anything warm. Um, no river. So, huh? <laughs> no like river. A, no river. Nothing, yeah, no river, no river, no river. I think this poem might have that um, detail in it that I was describing in my room. It's set in my room. It's another dream poem. Um, and, um, and somehow in it, I'm connecting, I'm, 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 I'm locating something that happened in the dream, but it was related to real life. You know, it was very related. So we can talk about it at the other side. It's called diurnal, diurnal, but why did I call it that? I think that doesn't, that mean it's, it's something that happens, recurs. I forgot what it means. <laughs> Jen can <laughs> hop in. It has to do with like, yeah. <laughs> Diurnal. I forgot. Can somebody Google it? <laughs> I've just totally forgot. I think it has something yeah. to do with recurrent, something that recurs. It is, yeah, but it's like a, like day daily. Daily, or... daily. Yeah, yeah, daily. yeah, yeah. Daily. Okay. There you go. There you go. Okay. All right. I had a dream over and over as a child in my shimmering morning light room. It was set there where I slept woodpeckers hammering at the eaves, the river's waves light moving as if forever on the far wall. I'd wake still asleep in the dream. I couldn't speak as the two hands hovered so that even if I thought I'd say, if only to ask, one would white gloved hit my face. I'd say slapped but the glove ate sound. Hmm. I don't remember waking. <clears throat> so I, there was this kind of repression going on, you know, like you couldn't express yourself. Maybe it's why I became a poet. You know, I think it might be one of the reasons and lots of lying. I think my, my mother's mother is sort of famous for not being truthful. And I think that's one reason that I, I just felt like I had to get the truth out. You know, <laughs> so that was my yeah. job <laughs> or I did, needed it to live, <laughs> you know, to be able to yeah. Um. So I don't know, it's so funny. I, it's so funny I hadn't thought about the metaphor really, but I do think it has something to do with this, um, the lack of water. Yeah, the lack of, the lack of water that you can drink or I don't know, the sus sustaining in some way. Um, yeah. Well, it seems like the central struggle is mirrored in the landscape. Uh -huh. Yeah. I don't know about you. It seems like this is, is the same for you as it is for me in that poetry is the way I think about things. So when there's like something that I'm really trying to work through, yeah, you know, the deeper something is, you know, trying to work through something, the more it comes out in poetry. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think it, yeah. And it comes out like to the side. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's not, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always think it's like pops out of your head, like uh, Athena out of Zeus. <laughs> 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 it's 
But which reminds me, I have an owl here in my owl house. Like I put it up an owl house oh. last year, and I think I did it too late. Mm -hmm. And then there were starlings, and that's a fairly common thing. It's a screech yes. owl house. Ugh. But then I had this pretty major surgery this winter, and then I, I so I was up really early, earlier than usual. And I looked out the window and there was an owl in it. Oh, I was sweet. so happy. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Athena's associated with owls. <laughs> sweet. Yes. I, I love to hear window, them. So I can just look out there and see it. We've got uh, a great think, horned um, owl in the woods below us. And oh, wow, um, wow. I will hear it. Um, you know, yeah. that kind of almost like a haunting. Ooh, 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 oh, really you know, and it, and it just seems to just like grow and fill yeah. the air like that and it, it, to me it's it it's a comforting sound yeah I, I, I like that sound it does not uh, seem like threatening or anything yeah it's like it's sort of encompassing and, and a nice yeah yeah hugging kind of yeah <laughs> yeah cool by the way this is a good time to jump in and remind everybody that this is a conversation so if like something that we're talking about sparks in a, a thought of your own if you have a question you'd like to ask and it doesn't even have to be about like one of the poems that um, Liz is reading it could be you know about something about the process or um, publishing or you know you're open for anything right Liz Absolutely. <laughs> even <laughs> bread baking <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. Perfect>. <laughs> <laughs> well you know that might come in too because there's like this rhythm yeah. that we go through yeah. with the like the physical world and the cerebral world the yeah. um i don't know about you but a lot of times it's when i'm walking or working in the garden that walking is I'm really good i need a lot more but walking is but is known to be great for the imagination yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. The bread, the bread, I make bread, I bake bread. And um, I'm going to start doing it for everybody, like the neighborhood again. I'm going to start delivering oh, again. Um, cool. But anyway, um, I uh, that's how I started. I started to look like making it. I was just bad, so much bread around. I had to do something. So I started baking and uh, delivering. But the thing that I like about it is when you first, if you've ever done it, so you know you know what this is like. At the beginning, the dough is just sticky and mess. It's like you can, ugh, it's all over your hands, like hard to get it off and back into the bowl. But then um, this, anyway, this the way I make it. Um, within 40 minutes, it becomes silky. You, you put salt and water on it and then suddenly it's just totally like a different thing. So there's something about that transformation that I just mm -hmm. never get tired of experiencing. So it's really, this is, um, and then later, you know, it gets even more wonderful. The, just the nature of the dough is so, um, mm -hmm. uh, it changes. Um, and I think that's true. I think that every good poem should have that kind of, event some sort of unanticipated um turn or change uh -huh. um uh or link like a link made um something explode like a little explosion uh that happens um but it can't you know frost said no surprise in the writer no surprise in the reader mm -hmm. and um it has to be a surprise to everyone or the readers onto it, you know, they can tell that they're being manipulated. Yes. So, um, yeah. So the way the dough happens, even though I know it's going to happen. Every time, uh -huh. you know? Don't know the <laughs> moment at which it's going to happen though. <laughs> yeah. There's, oh, oh, Amy has a uh, question. <laughs> Hello, hello. Sorry, I was late. Um, okay. Lisa Schreier reminded me or let me know, and I, I apologize for for being oh, absent. And I'm so, uh, I'm so glad I'm here too. I loved. I I came in for the last two poems, and they were they were stunning. Um, and I wanted to ask you. I'm I'm glad you're talking about walking and bread baking. Uh, I do a lot of the former, um, but I'm interested in, in fact that hard question of when you know a poem <laughs> is done. Um, I have a good poet friend who, who really hates poems that end. He doesn't like that. Well, I shouldn't say hate, but he, he yeah. said, I don't feel like things should be tied up and I'm not a poet. Right. Um, so, right. so I get well, to this is just. A great, such a great question. Oh my God. It's so great. Um, <laughs> I have like two angles on it. One did the last part, what you said, 
<clears throat> I tend to write these sequences. Not, not, not everything is, but um, one reason I like that is that the sections don't have to end. They, they're more mm -hmm. porous and then they just sort of bleed into the next one. So it's sort of like things don't have to, I, I had a teacher who said, your poems are all middles. <laughs> I'm not good at beginning or ending apparently. Um, so, um, but, but, but I think endings can be, I, I think of it as like hitting a tuning fork and the sound keeps going. Like mm -hmm. it, hitting it, like, it's like a, you know, hitting it is something that, you know, it, it has a, a sense of closure. It, 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 there's something like that, but it keeps going. So I think that because poetry is like music, I mean, I, I always tell people I'm more like a musician than anything else. Um, I, I think that metaphor really makes sense because the, whatever words or little phrase is at the end re can resonate for a long time. So mm -hmm. that means it doesn't really end. You know what I mean? It's sort of still going on. Um, I, had a, I, I, know, I know this poet, I, I don't know him personally, and I, I'm forgetting his name right now, but he, this is something someone told me about, and I was just, I was stunned. I was sitting waiting for a reading to begin, and it was a group of people, and I was looking at this poem I wanted to read. I said, I want to read this, but I don't like this part, and he just said, don't read it. Just don't read that part. Just don't read that part. Just change it, and so um, then he told me the story about this guy who would go into bookstores, find his books, and revise the poems with a pen change the poem, you know, like even after it was published, like a hardcover, I always imagine it being a hardcover book for some reason, you know, it's like really final and then just change them. And There's I, a story I was, about uh, artists and I can't remember what art it is, or artist it is, but maybe um, Lisa or Jen knows who would go into galleries <laughs> and like revise his paintings. <laughs> You always want to mess with them. I mean, I think that um, there's a famous they're never uh, done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're never done in a way. But but you know, if you can go too far, Marianne Moore yes. famously revised her poems to death, and so you have to go back to an earlier. Luckily, they've been published yet for us. That you have to go back to an earlier edition mm -hmm. to get the good the good stuff. Um, so there's there's a danger there, and I, I, I it's hard for me to tell you how to know, and I'm never 100 percent sure. It's, it's sort of why mm -hmm. I'm saying some of the things I'm saying, but. Um, I think sometimes, you know, sometimes, sometimes you're pretty sure. Yeah. It mm -hmm. feels like mm -hmm. it's completed itself, but it's completed itself. I feel like so much of what, what we do as, as writers and artists is, is, is not in our power. We're just sort of there kind of guiding, <laughs> guiding, <Right>. guiding mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, so it's, it's, it's a little tricky. It's, there's not an easy answer because it's just not linear. It's not a linear process. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, like, about Marianne Moore, who I read a long time ago um, when I was so young that I just felt befuddled. I read all of the yeah. armored animal poems, right? The penguin. Um, so what is, what did, do you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm so curious. Is there, is there something you remember about her work where you thought, oh, well, she, did she cut too much? Did she just expect us to leap too far? I haven't studied, I haven't like compared them and studied them at all, but I think it's almost like she just kept, you know, I don't know, like, like um, uh, sort of sanding them down or something, you know, so that they lost their, she was kind of making them too uniform. Uh, that's what I remember. It's been since I was in graduate school that I looked at them. But um, I, I, you know, if you just look at her, a poem like A Grave, and there are just certain poems of hers that are just so astonishing that I love to teach. Um, the, some of them are, are befuddling. Some of them are full of, you know, found material and facts mm -hmm. and, you know, right. um, and, and, and they, they, they don't have, the little explosions don't happen quite in the same way that I like to have happen in a poem, but um, I like to expose things more than cover them. Um, but she has some poems that are whew, just astonishing. Um, yeah, yeah, I love the grave. Is that the one that was, it was inspired by her looking at the ocean and a guy was standing in her way? Oh, I, really? I, I, I just have a way. bit of, like she oh, and her mother. Funny. Really oh, funny. there you go. <laughs> that's <laughs> what I remember, but this is a long time. Yeah, that's a great story. I don't know that. Yeah, I don't know. Well, it, well, let's make it real. <laughs> um, now we can all say thank you. That's a, a thank you so much. I'm, I'm just always curious how poets go about this because it's such a. Yeah, it's hard to, to say. It's kind of becomes like a, it becomes a lot of times, like when I'm working with a student, a lot of times you take lines away at the end because they've covered up the ending's too scary. It's like they don't want to they don't want to expose it. And so they cover it up with some more language. And so sometimes taking away some lines at the end, that's that's an, that's one way to 
that's a strategy, I think, sometimes to find the right ending. Um, so I don't know if that's if that's a helpful at all. If you're if there are any writers out there. <laughs> <clears throat> so do you have um, more of a problem with like in a lot of time a lot of times poets will write past the ending and then have to cut That's back I, mean. That's what I, mean. I find w- with me I sometimes abandon it too soon I haven't gotten there You'll yet get to the ending yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah I, 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 read, I read this thing wonderful wonderful thing I was I always say the same thing uh, to my students about revision and so I decided to like go online and sort of see what other people said just kind of maybe add and there was this great thing that I found this woman um said when you're revising try doubling the length of the poem double it well and then you don't have to keep it all but uh, it just takes you farther. And sometimes you'll realize I don't need to go farther. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's not, it's not really helpful, but it might lead you somewhere like another turn or another twist or something. Um, some subject matter that you hadn't thought of that's associated with whatever you were writing about. You never know. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, I, thought it was, I thought that was just so great. And everybody started doing it. It was really uh-huh. great. All my students started doing it. It was terrific. Because it because it got them to go farther, you know, um, than they thought they needed to or could. Uh, so it was really really wonderful. Um, and along the way, the surprise they might have found happened. something. <laughs> might have found the ending, you know. Maybe they found yeah. the ending. Maybe that was part of the problem. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> By the way, Jen has shared a link to a grave. So if anybody. Oh, good. Oh, great. Oh, great. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. I love that long. There's a line that just says long line. There's a really, it's in long lines. They're kind of uneven line links, but um, there's one long line where the sentence like goes far, it's like breathless. It goes farther than, because <laughs> she's uh-huh. trying to, because the, the speaker's trying to deny the presence of death, <laughs> trying to escape it. <laughs> uh-huh. Good luck. <laughs> always there it's the one thing I had, a, I had a teacher who said the only thing that's per I said something about uh, I, one of my points I said well it's not perfect he said well the only thing that's perfect is death <laughs> 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 I think that's also kind of um encouraging when you're working because then you don't feel like everything has to be perfect yeah <laughs> yeah it, <laughs> that will keep you from doing the liberating for polishing <laughs> keep going yeah well, looking at Marianne Moore, I mean, uh, Elizabeth Bishop's um, uh, uh, drafts, there's this wonderful book. Um, you, you'll find it. I, I, I forget to tell it's sitting around here. So, or it's in my office where I haven't been for two years. University <laughs> <laughs> of Maryland. But anyway, um, it's, it's wonderful. It's really, it was really um, controversial because, you know, she was a perfectionist and mm-hmm. people, you know, she, I don't think she would have liked that. And a lot of people thought we shouldn't do, we shouldn't show everybody all these drafts, but they're just astonishing and like the beginning of one art you know that this famous famous amazing poem yes. the begin- it's just a big mess it's just a mess oh god <laughs> total mess there's so many words uh-huh. filled with words so i think this is such a great great another liberating thing you can start with a mess like the dough like the bread dough yeah you're right exactly <laughs> a big sticky horrible you know ugh. A mess you want to run away from. It's like, ugh, what anything to do with this? And then in 40 minutes, it's transformed into this um, magical thing. So, so 10 minutes, even if you only have 10 minutes, sit down, you might be surprised by what happens. So I try to remind myself of that. Oh, great. Good advice for all of us. <laughs> I um, went to bring together a couple things that we've been talking about. Um, One is flow, one is the surprise, one is like where, um, oh, it's something we haven't talked about yet, but that I'd like to talk about, which is like the breath in your poems and the white space and the, the, the way the poems sometimes um, are, a a long kind of um uh a f- like a folded sentence <laughs> but uh you know your poem flow dynamics yeah 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 i'm trying to remember. i was just thinking of that it's so funny um i have to figure out where it is um 
Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. I can like put a link you know to what book it is. I forgot what book it's in. Uh, it it was, I know it appeared in. It might be in Skeleton Coast. Let's see. Okay. Here's. I know. Link. I know the poem, but I. See, here's a quick link to it. You can just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, so Jen and I both hop to it. <laughs> I, I'd rather just read it from this. Okay, sure. You give me a second. Um, um, yeah, do you want me to read it? Yeah, please do. So what were you thinking about it? Do you want to say a little bit about it? Well, I want you to just read it and see if everybody like sure. catches them is what caught me. <laughs> this is in the book that has the Nile in it. So that's what's uh, going on here. And I was thinking about Sub-Saharan Africa in this poem. Um, where I wanted to go, because all the people I was hanging out with were really Sudanese. They were so close to Sudan. Uh -huh. so Egypt is a strange place. It's got um, like the, 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 the sort of ruling class are all Arab and they mostly live in Cairo and on weirdly the east side of the Nile, <laughs> at least uh -huh. in <clears throat> and then And then there are Berber people who are really Libyan. These, you know, these borders were fake. They're just yeah. they made up. So in the Western part where I went uh, for a while, the Berber, Berber people, but in the South, it's, it, there's Su Su Sudan. I mean, it's really, uh, you know, the, the line is just, it's crazy. Um, I guess they put the, I don't know. Anyway, I'm not sure <laughs> what them to do with that, the, the uh, Europeans, but um, anyway. Um, okay, so what do I know? Oh, okay, it's a little bit about this poem. Now, I, one thing that hasn't come up yet is, well, I did mention that I had surgery. I have, ever since I was a teenager, I've had some health issues. Um, I had, uh, I had cancer as a teenager and then they, they, they did a kind of massive radiation <laughs> therapy, which saved my life, but it's caused a lot of problems since. And one is my heart is uh, messed up. So um, that's one thing. Sometimes I have these poems of panic, you know, about my heart uh, um, because so, so it could happen so quickly, you know? So I, my imagination goes there sometimes. And I think this, this poem, but this poem is, this poem is actually related. Okay. So, so, so the heart is there, but the, I, I'm not now remembering that when they did radiate me, you, you have a superior vena cava, which is this enormous vein that goes straight down your chest. Um, and the blood goes back to the heart through that vein, through that giant uh, vein and, um, and the radiation destroyed it. But somehow my body made a little bypass <laughs> They like a little vein that just bypassed the destroyed part. And I didn't know this until I was in my early forties and they did a, a scan and the ra the radiologist used the word obliterated. <laughs> it's like, that was it. I mean, you know, like right inside my body, something so important was obliterated. I remember when I was, I remember after I read that I was standing in my apartment by the window and I just felt like I was descending into a black hole. I, you know, it was just one of those, terrifying moments and you know it's right and it's, it's so inside you and so central that yeah. there's nothing you can do so I think that's part of where this poem came from but I get into all these rivers and this well I think it's all um this is all the Nile um but th these are like little um th there are these, these are little places where the Nile does this it does the same thing hmm. flow dynamics so lightly and invisibly I hardly knew it river of blood descending without joy back to the heart through the frail vein all that time, the largest of the body shredded then dissolved, obliterated. And there was a sudden seepage into surrounding tissue instead of the blood pouring out as you'd expect forever. And a new vein formed to bypass what was gone like a wide meander even the smallest flood ends and the river goes straight from that point. But in my case, the thin walled base ends held, forming an anabranch, a section of a river that diverts from the main channel, rejoins it downstream. Local ones can be caused by or make small islands in the watercourse, but sometimes they flow hundreds of miles like the Bar El Zarif in the South Sudan that splits from the Bar al Jabal at the White Nile doesn't return until Malakal. Instead of leaving behind as it could have with the blood being old, a full fledged oxbow lake that before too long will blister in the sun become a little blue scar beside the heart. The 
it's so evocative. <laughs> but you were talking about sentences before, and this one plays with those sentences that are river-like. Uh, too. Very, yes. Very <laughs> river- really I mean, getting beaten kinda... to death. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I noticed that reading is kind of hard to read because the sentence kept going and to kind of parse the sentence in my voice. I think it's, is it all one sentence? I don't know. Let's see. It's pretty I close. See, I, I don't see any periods. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, so, yeah, the way you read it, it really, I, th- I think, uh, emphasized the meaning and was fairly easy to follow. But I think. The first time I read it, it was a little bit, I mean, it was very meandery. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's like um, I'm working through, I feel like I'm working through something, you know, it's like something it's, it's hard to face this stuff, you know? And so I yeah. think it's, there's like a um, avoidance going on a little bit of avoidance going on, um, which I hope heightens tension. You know, that's something you yeah. for, but <clears throat> What? really caught me at first, and I'm not sure if this stood out to everybody else, so people chime in, (laughs) is uh, near the very beginning when it says, let's see, Um, yeah, oh yeah, it's just very, very beginning. So lightly and invisibly, I hardly knew it, river of blood descending without joy back to the heart so that without joy part is what just yeah just really yeah I noticed that too (laughs) (laughs) I haven't read this one in ages (laughs) yeah yeah there's a kind of um dejection you know to me it's it was more like a matter of factness not dejection so much as it's just doing its thing um, okay, I see, and but it's it's almost like the like the the speaker, which is like you and your past there, <laughs> um, is trying to be dispassionate about the function of the body. Right. Yeah, you hear that a lot. Like you know, sort of giving definitions and things that are happening. It's a little Mary and more like we get back to Mary and more <laughs> flat, but without joy is emotional even though maybe the tone of it is is cold but it is it is emotional because you can kind of almost sense the poet distancing herself from her own body yeah absolutely which is that's an emotional thing yeah that there's that avoidance i was talking about yeah avoiding it it's too much to face it's Mm -hmm. too frightening but Um, in a way it makes it deeper because if you had put in that desperation that you can feel and the fear that might have felt more more managed or something you know I, I don't know <laughs> I'm so not the exp- fact that it's being repressed almost yeah. gives it more power I believe yeah. that's true I I really believe that I think a little lyricism goes a long way, you know, a little uh-huh. emotional, it's, you know, coming out, uh, uh, expressing it openly co- goes a long way. Yes. Um, yeah. you can, I, I don't, I always try to keep it under control. You know, I don't want to, because I think that when it comes out in, in however, whatever way it happens, mm-hmm. it has much more force if it's minimized. Um, lyric, yeah. lyrical, sort of lyrical gestures or p- power. So the tone of without joy, even though without joy brings the human into the story. Uh, it's not just a scientific paper, <laughs> you know? Yes. Uh, it, but but, it's, but it, the tone of it uh, tamps it down, kind of. So it, it makes me, this is a metaphor that I like to use um, because I rode horses when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And um, this whole idea of um, like the difference between the flapping reins and the horse just sort of going wherever it wants and then holding the reins tighter and having a kind of momentum, like the mm-hmm. power of the horse increases when you hold the reins tighter somehow, you know? Mm-hmm. I think the word for that is momentum, but there might be another word, but there's something um, contain, contained power, something, I forget what uh, tennis 
commentators use this phrase. Um, I watch tennis a lot too, where um, the, instead of, uh, I forget what it is. I forgot, and I, I'm not, I shouldn't have mentioned it because I can't remember what it is, but it's like somehow it's power that's controlled somehow. Pa pa the power needs to be sort of held in mm -hmm. to a certain extent for it to really be powerful. So I think there's something to do with that. I'm so sorry to jump in and add all this stuff, but um, the horse thing, um, I, that that's and it's the same with dogs like I have dogs too and if you they could just run around and be you know but if you start playing a game with them and they and they want it they want you to throw it but you don't throw it right away mm -hmm. there's they, there's so much more power in them and so much more you know force in them and then they go and it's so much more explosive when they go you know so it's kind of like that there's something to do with containing something to, to, to but it sounds like it would make it less powerful but it makes it more powerful that that's yeah. a really kind of yeah I think it's something like that, maybe that's happening. Yeah, that I hope. Sense. I hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, definitely, you know, I hope. <laughs> it got to me. <laughs> oh, that's good to hear. That's really good to hear. Yeah, and then, then wondering what could have happened, like the blood pouring out forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah but, that, it said, but it's said like in this way that again, it's kind of contained instead of you know, the blood pouring out for, and the way that sentence, it's kind of Marianne Moore, like took his way, the line goes out. Marianne Moore taught me to, I always, my lines were always kind of the same length for a long time. Yeah. And then she taught me to be able to, I always think of it as, I, I did think of metaphors. I think of it, letting the line out. I went fishing a lot when I was young on, the, on, the, on that river and you let the line out, you know, and, and that's uh -huh. how I think of those lines just going out. Cause I, if it's a physical thing, then it has a power. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I love having, I love uneven line links now. I just love that um, option, you know, that option of being able to do that at a certain moment, at a key moment, yeah. Though you also have like the, sh the shorter lines that right. and a lot right. of white space in between that, that yeah. also in a way is sort of like the contained power where, at, where you, you have to pace the way you read it. Um, Interesting, yeah. And then things are exposed mm -hmm. in those single lines. Sometimes I do it just like, I think I might've started writing a couplets when I, just to help me revise so I could see what was there. And then I started just keeping them. I, I don't know when that happened, but yeah. So that's a-, a meander. <laughs> I love <to> say, <laughs> meander. I love to say some of the sound, <laughs> like a wide meander. <laughs> <laughs> I love how long it takes to say that word. Yeah. The word uh -huh. itself meanders. <laughs> <laughs> the why meander. Anyway. Um, what time is it? Is it getting? Oh wow, well, we're getting toward the end. What should I read last? Oh my god. Maybe I might read a poem that was read um on 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 the radio. I I, I hadn't thought about that poem in a long time. And and um this poem um what is it? Um, Rocky boy, Rocky boy. And I think, oh, I, I think yeah, right. Yes. I yeah. I'm going to read it. Cause I, um, I think it's timely mm -hmm. um, with what's happening in Ukraine. And um, this book was about um, these soldiers who were injured in world war one, mostly in the face and they had to have plastic surgery and um, I've had to have plastic surgery. So I couldn't write about it directly. And then I, I saw images, these drawings that this guy did of these before and after drawings of these soldiers whose faces were reconstructed. Um, and it just blew my mind. I don't know, I was, I was there, I was in this museum in London for a different reason mm -hmm. and I hated the main exhibit. It was like freaking me out. So there yeah. was this little room and I escaped into this little room and there were these drawings. Um, and it just, you know, that's where this book came from. But anyway, this poem doesn't talk about that directly. But it, it's called it's called effacement. The name of the book. Um, but this is just one. You know, it's a it's, it's it's a related situation. Iraqi boy would appear to be peach white overwashed overwashed pajamas in the washed out newspaper photo. On one side droop like a monk's hood, the upper half of that leg raised with the other whole one. And the hands, they're there. And the less washed out pink balloon above them that they reach for or have just let go. The latter probably, as one hand, palm up, is wide of it. 
two thirds of a laughing mouth visible, the wheelchair in this case, its sparkle stark against the flannel and plied living limbs within it, a tool of fun. Such wisdom's possible here only, the ability to feel glad to be alive, gone on the outside, the cloistered incarceration of the ward, holding the boys as if they were a group of monks. Asked by a visitor what it's like to live secluded most of the time, mute and with forced labor, a chronic lack of sleep for all the praying, the Benedictine monk asked back, have you ever been in love? That's such a surprise at the end. Yeah, it surprised me. That's from a book by, um, oh God, um, I have all of his books around here. It's wonderful, wonderful. I'm so terrible with names. It's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful uh, travel writer. Um, oh, so it took my tongue. Anyway, I, I borrowed some language. I borrowed the story from him at the very end. But one thing about I, the, I, mean, about I the monks. Yeah, yeah, about the monks. I, I should have said um, this before. The guys, the, the, the soldiers that were wounded in the face, they were so disfigured that in France, they created these, this like, I don't know, like a, a country club kind of thing just for them and their families so that they could not be stared at, you know, not have to deal with that. So there was this kind of, um, they had to be in an enclosed world to feel okay. And yeah. in the hospitals, like when they came, you know, and straight from the front, straight from the trenches, the nurses would take all the mirrors off the walls. Wow. Yeah, so it's very um, intriguing. Um, so it's, it reminded me of that. It reminded me of that. That, that I think I was sort of t that story was sort of being in my imagination uh, going into. I just saw a photograph of this uh, guy, this kid. Um, so I kind of made up a story in my mind about them. I had read about. I think it was. I can't, don't remember what war it was. It was before World War One, where I think it was a mask maker who started making like yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Um, like yeah, yeah, an artist, an artist, yeah. an artist started making these intricately designed. I think they were made of tin. It was very thin. Yeah, I think tin. I think you're right. Them. Yeah, you paint them, and that was something that they did. The BBC had these people working in the basement. You know, they in the middle of the night. They that's when they would work so that nobody would see them. Uh, okay. wow. of, part of that was um was that world war one or was it earlier world war one okay and, so. and, and they were they were because they were all in the trenches and their heads were up and the head doesn't have yeah. any major except for the brain doesn't have major organs so you can get pretty badly wounded and survive mm -hmm. so that's yeah like it was a lot of the jaw stuff a lot of claws, yeah. A lot of jaws. Yeah. yeah 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 and it's amazing like how much that like <sighs> it's not just superficial I mean, it just really goes deep. The way the way your face looks just yeah. really. Yeah, can't go to the grocery your... store. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, amazing. So, but the Iraqi boy was in a wheelchair and uh, was. Yeah, it's in a, there's a photograph in the paper. I just saw this photograph in the paper. But they were it was playing with a balloon. They were playing. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, the joy of being alive is glad to be kind of like that being in love being in love with life like what the benedictine monk says that right. in spite of like the being in this enclosed what is it like a rehabilitation place or just a yeah ward i thing? think so that's what i think a hospital yeah so the, being in love with life kind of uh supersedes everything well i think that there's something um asked by the visitor what's like to live secluded most of the time i think that it's um there's there is joy in it yeah there's joy there's genuine joy in it um but it's that that line that's that question at the end yeah so it goes much farther than just saying joy you know what i mean it's something right. um, more visceral more utter um Yeah. 
there's a lot that you will give up or put up with when you're in love. <laughs> yeah, it's a drug. <laughs> it's, a, it's transforming. It's transforming. I think that the um, the kids, you know, again, it was my imagination, but they were having so much fun. They they'd forgotten. They'd forgotten what happened. You know, they were um, playing. So I think, I don't know, somehow that the ending seemed, um, that question seemed, again, non-linearly, you know, non, non whatever, linearity, whatever that word is, <laughs> linear, <laughs> not in a non-linear way, um, yes. really um, uh, apropos, um, that under the circumstances with other, if you're with other people who have the same problem, you're able to forget about it. and and um, experience life to its fullest, I guess. So it seems to me that when you're reading the poem the first time and you get to that ending that you it seems at first, wait, what does this have to do with the Iraqi boy? It sends you back into the poem. Yeah. And yeah. It, it actually does kind of like what we were talking about at the beginning about <laughs> poems ending or not ending um the reverberation yeah 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 yeah, yeah it's like a non-ending ending oh i like that i like yeah. that i love that because it just sends you right back in yeah and the ability to feel glad to be alive it, and the, in the end it has to do with god you know that that's part of what you know in a, in a, in a monastery that's part of yes. where the supercharged joy is coming from but there's something analogous i think going on mm -hmm. um because they're so close, they almost died. You know, they could have died. Yes. We're close to that. And it somehow what springs from that is exhilaration. And it's, it's not, um, it's not logical, mm -hmm. but it, it's, but it's true. Yeah. 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 And the poem gets at that. Yeah. Thanks for pushing me there. I think I kind of lost some energy. <laughs> I I understand it better. My favorite line in the poem is the flannel and plied living limbs within it. <laughs> My favorite line. <laughs> it's like yander. Plied. It is, yes. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> the other thing that I have noticed amongst your poems is this kind of the, the, the reaching for contact with others, with the landscape, the, that like the always, they're always reaching for it. <laughs> that's good. I think that's good. Difficulty. Having it's trouble getting to connecting yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's true about me. <laughs> <All of that. laughs> but I, but I crave it, you know, just like yeah. a human being. <laughs> This, this, um, the pandemic's been so strange that way, you know, yes. and some might be think it's like ready-made for somebody for who's a little reclusive like me, but it took me a while to get used to get used to being alone so much. I had to learn how though. I'm I'm still a little, you know, I'm still, I'm still looking forward to, I'm still not quite ready to go out because I'm high risk, but I, um, I'm ready. I mean, I'm, I'm feeling more and more like I need to get out there and be around people. When you, um, so I know that uh, you took a break from breaking bread for, bread for the co-op. Um, well, yeah, they, yeah, they're not, they don't, they're not, I'm not, I'm just going to do it for y'all. I'm going to do okay. it for neighbors again. I'm going back to that. Yeah. It didn't work out. It's a long story. Okay. There. It was great. It was so much fun being there. I want, I would be there. I would be there on Friday still, but they wanted me to rent it. Ah. It mm. would have just canceled out, you know, the, Yeah. Yeah. I understand basically so yeah uh, but I was thinking that was probably a kind of uh yes it was that, yeah. <laughs> that huge. Probably fed. huge 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 yeah it was huge mm -hmm. I really loved it I loved it but I can't like they don't I keep kind of pleading with them to, to let me do it but they're not going to they things that the management has changed there yeah I think they are struggling to kind of make a go of it because of uh 
you know, they, there's only so far that grant money can go and it runs out and you exactly. need to stand on their own two feet. And exactly. I understand. And the kitchen, I think, is a uh, is a uh, revenue source for them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know it was so much fun to have people come in and choose their loaf. Yes. Yeah. And after it came out of the oven, <laughs> uh-huh. which one do you want? They go, hmm, because <laughs> they all look like <laughs> <from> each other. <laughs> yeah, no, I miss it. I miss it. Yeah. But I'll soon be coming to your doors again and saying hi. Which we love too. <laughs> <laughs> If anybody out there is interested in bread, um, find my, I don't know how to, I can give you my number. You can just it's great. Text. It's good stuff. Here's my number. Are you ready? <laughs> don't don't abuse it. 301 832 2243. And if you text me, I'll put you on the list if you want to be on the list. And what I, I make it every week or so, maybe every other week. And I let everybody know what I'm making. And then you just decide if you want some. Because so. she has different kinds. I make different kinds. Yeah, it's all it's all kind of crusty country style, uh, natural leaven. I I mill part of the I mill about half the flour because um, it's a little heavier, so I mix it with you know commercial milk too. But it's all organic. And it's very good, very good for you. you can feed your body as well as your soul. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I just gave my number out to whoever. God. To everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna just You're going to be getting called. And Amy wants you to deliver <laughs> to Frederick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Frederick. Oh, God. Yeah, I can't deliver in Frederick. <laughs> it's a little far. <laughs> well, thank um, you. Are we ending? I'm not sure. We, we can keep going if you want to, but um, I'm happy to. I think we've been sort of going till about 11.30 or so. Okay. Um, but, okay. you know, if people have questions or uh, comments, or maybe you could read a little bit more. Let's see quite, let's give them a second to um, ask questions. And... While you're looking for the next poem. <laughs> let's see. Um... Um, I don't know, I'm trying to decide. Um, I have this poem that's kind of fragmenty. Um, and I am very exposed to that, but I guess I have to live up to my, um, you know, what I ask of others. <laughs> read it. Um, It's pretty new, so I hope it's finished. You know, I'm not quite sure. I, I've got revisions on it. <laughs> it's like one little thing. I think it's uh-huh. Being, I changed the word seeing to being. A way of seeing to uh-huh. a way of being. So you have to, you'll have to give me some advice about that. <laughs> okay, it's really, ooh, it's kind of scary to read. Okay, he fed me with his hands as his father had fed his mother in Sierra Leone in the 70s, the food a mush in his fingers. We were practically nude. I liked it, didn't feel debased. Is this the wound that I can slip so easily into another's world, another's way of being? I experience more that way, I say, but the risk, annihilation right there, as if it weren't possibly fatal, giving that much the nest a tomb. Did you say, is this a wound? Yeah, is this, a, is this the wound? The wound. The wound. There's kind of a related poem, which is, seems happier. <laughs> <laughs> but it's about the same kind of, at the end, it's kind of about the same fear um, of um, sort of giving so much or really 
allowing oneself to be transformed mm -hmm. um, in the presence of another person mm -hmm. and how scary that is and how maybe dangerous that is. And it has been dangerous for me, like literally yes. really dangerous in the past. Um, that remember the sociopath? <laughs> yeah, that's what I exactly what I immediately what I thought. Of. <laughs> how far do you go with this? Um, you know, it's it's like unless you allow yourself to be changed in relation to another person, there's nothing really happening. You know, you have to be able to do that. But there, it's I have trouble controlling it. I guess. So let, let me read this poem. This poem is about travel. It's an older poem. It's definitely finished. But at the end, you'll see there's like it gets a little. Like what? Oh my God. Is this, you, you worry about the speaker, <laughs> like worry a little bit about the speaker. At least I do. I worry about the speaker. <laughs> and I had a friend who looked and read it. It's like it's soon after all this horrible things happened in my life. She said she had, I could see her visibly worrying. Uh -huh. <laughs> so here we go. Um, so this is, I was planning to go to this island off the coast of Kenya. So that's what I was, and I was thinking about it. I was thinking about going and um, imagining it from home. So um well, the photos suffer compared to the reality. The water farther up the coast be as blue as against the green. And will the green be as green? That kind of green after rain green I'll be seeing for the first time in the rainy season. June and July or winter on the equator. Will the water rise almost over the creek's banks, dividing island from island, so close to shore they seem like points or peninsulas? Island from island, town from town, and villages. No cars, only donkeys and dows to carry people to and from their houses, the houses of friends, market, work. Who will be there? Who will I be there? Who will meet what me? Hmm. I really like that. Who will I be there? Yeah. <laughs> I'm quaking in my boots. <laughs> how transformed and how far do you go in this thing? Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's really ends up being about identity. A lot of, um, in, in my books, there are all kinds of subjects. Things are going on, blah, 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 blah. But it seems like something that keeps like the, like the, uh, I don't know, the, the, the um, um, compass needle keeps coming back, like, in, you know, inevitably to mm -hmm. questions about identity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and um, yeah, and sort of, you know, how to locate it, uh, how to define it, how to feel sure of it. There's a, I can't believe I'm talking about this so openly. <laughs> it's kind of weird, but I, there's a kind of sense of, um, uh, uncertainty there like just uh or terror really there's some terror. yes yeah for some reason that reminds me of two poems i i lived in um nicaragua for uh three years and i didn't know that i wrote a lot of poems about nicaragua and also kind of a some of it is also about like the approach to travel um mm -hmm. and so i wrote two poems that were sort of like almost opposite personas right and I think in some ways I have both within me so I, was, I guess I was trying to identify the poles um okay. and one is like the the one who just throws herself into travel and just like you know no plan just experience what comes yeah. along and uh, yeah. you know kind of lose yourself in like wow. the colors and smells and tastes of uh you know that are, are so new um and the other one is the one who like reads the guidebooks beforehand so that, you know, so she won't regret having come so <laughs> close to some, you know, something and missed it because she didn't know it was there, you know, right, just, right, right. but a much more controlled yeah. Um, yeah. A, a, approach. So you know, they, they both have something to say um, to each other. Yeah. Yeah. They're both important. I think yeah. a little bit, maybe about like finding a balance. Yeah. <laughs> but can you really absorb what, you know, the world you're in a very different world, you know, and even in Nicaragua, it's very different from here. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people, I remember when I was, I got on this um, chartered plane back to Europe from Egypt during the revolution. And it was just a complete fluke because there were no ATMs, I had no money. It was just unbelievable, yeah. unbelievable. 
So I, I managed to get onto it somehow just by crying in the middle of the airport. I think that's how I succeeded doing it. <laughs> Finding someone who was sympathetic, you know, who had some power. And um, so I was waiting in the little area before you get on the plane, if I can put, you know, the little waiting area. And um, there were all these people who'd been on, been on a tour, been on some kind of tour, you know, and I was in Luxor. Um, you know, where all the ruins are. That's usually what's yes. true. And, um, and, and all the, all the tombs, amazing tombs. And um, these people were talking about the Super Bowl. It was <laughs> like they were in, you know, Chicago or something. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, where did you ever leave? Did you ever uh-huh. leave? You know, that was my impression. Did you ever, yeah. people are being killed. There's a revolution going on and they're talking about the Super Bowl. That's wow. obviously, yeah. Energetically. And for a lot of succinct to take period, <laughs> I'm just sitting there because I'm shell shocked, you know. That's even more extreme than people going to Paris or whatever and asking where the McDonald's is, you know. Yeah, it's, 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 but it's, an, it's the same kind of thing. But I think yeah. most people, so many people, just travel in this very insulated way. Mm-hmm. And it's but to go the other to go get outside of the insulated thing can be very uh, dangerous. Yeah, in yeah. More than one way, not just you know, not just like physically, but, you know, psychologically dangerous. So, right. Yeah. So that, so it's, I think, but I think it's worth it, worth trying. <laughs> it's I worth so becoming too. less I, insulated. Yeah. <laughs> and not only because of what you can then absorb, um, you know, the, the things you can experience that in larger world, but they, I think, you know, going back to identity, they change yeah. you. Who will I be? Yeah. I think it is, <laughs> you contain even more multitudes than <laughs> the possibility of multitudes that you can yeah. contain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, and, and yeah, and you don't want to, I don't know, it's, um, you want to be among them. <laughs> yeah, your yeah. frames of reference, you know, your, your ability to judge things, I think, is improved the more exposure you have to other ways of thinking and other people's experiences and what you learn about their attitudes towards you and the country you come from and your culture and the way it has affected the world. You know, if you're from, if you're from within that world, you don't see how people from without it see it. I think there's a tendency for richer cultures to just think of everybody else as subpar, you know, just sort of beneath, and it's not, it's, it means not all the way too aristocratic, but there is a kind of assumption mm-hmm. that um, they're just like the mechanicals in a Shakespeare play, you know, they're kind of insignificant, ultimately, the people yeah. of the country you're visiting. You know? yeah. I remember yeah. when I got off the plane and I had to, I, I went straight to this place way in West. When I got off the plane in Cairo, I went straight West and uh, really far West, almost to Libya. And I had a, there were part, it was like a little tour. It was really a tiny company people they were great they were it was like one house and it wasn't a big tourist company or anything but they did have a driver for me so the driver took me and um I think it's the first time in my life I read driver <laughs> it was weird. Yeah. but um but the, this guy and I were talking and he was still, all he would say all he would do this is right before the revolution but of course I didn't know it was going to happen and I guess nobody really knew how extreme it was going to be but um all he talked about was Mubarak and how he, how much he hated him and how horrible he was and as I as we were going I was thinking oh my god I was when I went to Egypt. I thought, okay, I'm just going to see. If I'm going to be like an ancient Egypt. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, I think. That I didn't realize I was assuming that until I was sitting in the car with this guy, and then I realized I'm in the Middle East. You know, I think that's one where that line came from. You know, it's like I'm in the fucking Middle East, <laughs> and there's a lot of bad stuff going on here. Um, so that was a good. That was good for me to be in that car. Now I, I don't know how the the people who talked about the Super Bowl would deal with that. They probably have more they wouldn't be alone traveling alone can be very good for this kind of thing and i like to travel alone they'd probably have a group of people in the car they'll be just talking to each other <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know they just say i need to, I, i'm getting hungry now you know that's all <laughs> <laughs> <Where's the> mcdonald's <laughs> so, so it's interesting i mean I, this driver even stopped and he had more than one wife more than one wife of course you know it's um it's a muslim country and so we stopped at one of his wife's house house and it was very interesting you know i was just kind of wandering around and um so he, so i don't think that would have happened with the super bowl people they wouldn't have allowed that yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> 
but if you get involved with anyone, then it really gets complicated. <laughs> it's really complicated. Um, and that happened to me. So, yeah, well, <laughs> we went down as a family. So uh, yeah. I did not get in romantically involved yeah. with anybody, but you right, right. We got involved with our empleada or uh, the woman who came to, she would clean our house and do our laundry and stuff. You got to know and, her a little bit. I mean, we still, nice. it's been, let's see, we moved back in 2003 Right. And I mean, we helped her daughter with her college expenses. Yeah. We're still in touch with her. That's her really super great. It's yeah. yeah, you're you're just like you're involved. Yeah. <laughs> and just you know, when things were happening in Nicaragua with um, you know protests against Ortega and stuff, and yeah, kind of had the inside view of you know how people think about that. It's really good to know yeah. more. Yeah. Yeah. The world, I mean, your world just grows larger. It does. Yeah, you just see more dimensions of mm -hmm. um, that travel grant was just such a great thing for me because I really hadn't lived wow. anywhere else, you know. And it forces you to outside outside of your comfort zone. In a, you know, On what basis did you get the travel grant? Uh, like a you send your you send um you send like a I think I sent a whole manuscript, but you don't mm -hmm. there are no letters, so there's not it's not political. I just sent a manuscript and uh, a lot of people do it. Luckily, some poems from it, and I, you know, I never dreamed that I would get poems in Paris Review, but a, 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 this guy, I knew, I kind of knew the editor. The editor was there like just for a blink of an eye, <laughs> really quick. Dan Chasen, you know, he writes, he writes reviews in the New Yorker now. He's, he's better known now, but he, I knew him from, I was in Cambridge for a year and on another kind of grant and Cambridge Mass. And he was, he was doing his PhD and, um, and he was doing it on a poet, um, uh, Frank Bedart, who I knew, and oh, yeah. so we kind of our, our social circles kind of intersected, and so I I, I didn't know him well at all, mm -hmm. but um, I, he knew of me, you know, and he, he he knew me a little bit. So I so I knew he was. I did I know he was there when I said it. I can't remember. I think he may have asked me for stuff. I can't remember exactly how it happened, but I actually put together like a little sort of mini version of effacement, the one about the um, soldiers. I kind of made like a little skeleton version of the of the sequence that was maybe eight pages or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he published it. <laughs> okay. So yeah. people saw it. And then I learned later that, that one, at least one of the people on the committee had read it and really liked it, but they didn't know me, but they really liked it. So I think that's why I got it. That's why I got it. So wow. it was just kind of a it's serendipitous thing. I'm so glad I got it though, just because it was really, really, um, it changed my life. It, it, it enriched my life just so utterly, completely. And it really, really was a big thing. So I recommend, you know, if you can't get it, find some way to live abroad, even if it's just for a few months. Um, yeah, yeah. I would recommend that too, highly. <laughs> the only requirement for this grant, once you get it, is to be out of North America for 12 consecutive months. That's the requirement. They don't require any that you produce anything or anything. Uh -huh. <laughs> so were you in... Oh, like all over Africa then for that? Uh, no, those, no, I was, I was I was really, I was really in, um, I, w I, I traveled around some, but I was mostly in Sicily because it was cheap. You know, the money, they don't give you a ton of money. Okay. And I was really interested in, um, and, and, and I visited just recently, right before I learned that I got it, I, I had visited um, uh, Syracuse, Syracuse, which was a Greek colony. Uh -huh. And there's this island called Ortigia, which I guess is like Ortiga. We just say Ortiga, Ortigia. Um, that was that has this uh, has all these all these ruins, just amazing ruins, Greek ruins. But there was there was a um, cathedral that's just a regular old you know Catholic cathedral, except that you can see it's built out of basically, and you can see the enormous Doric columns from a temple to Athena. <laughs> <laughs> and you walk along and there they all are. And I just, it blew my mind. They're inside too. And that just blew my mind. So when I, when I learned that I got the Amy Lowell, I immediately said, that's where I want to go. That's where I want to live. So I lived there for about, I think, seven months. Mm -hmm. And the rest of it, I kind of, I moved around a little bit. But, I, but while I was there, I went to Egypt. I just decided to go there. It was ah. just, a, I, and, and I was, um, I was waiting at the airport and, and Etna erupted. <laughs> my plane was delayed i mean it was a small eruption it happens all the time but uh, that was kind of uh, yeah we had volcanoes in uh nicaragua too that would yeah. uh, get active now and then yeah guatemala i've seen them in guatemala yeah. 
Um, I wanted to uh, let you know that Lisa Shirer uh, had to leave a little bit early. She said, this has been wonderful and has given me a lot to ponder. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. I look forward to meeting you sometime. Um, I have to go on to the next event. Peace all. So that was she's an artist. So, you know, she just okay. uh, she really uh, appreciates like the talking about the the ways that the craft of poetry and uh fine art um intersect yeah they, yeah they, intersect they, yeah. yeah 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 absolutely yeah absolutely is there anything anybody else would like to say before we end this was great thank you so much <laughs> i really else. enjoyed this the people i can't see and i can see patsy's barn <laughs> they're nearby I'd like to go back there one day. There you are. Hi. How's it going? You're outside. Ooh. I can't hear you. I can't. You must. Are you muted? Hi. Yes. There I've been listening. Are. Hi. I've been listening <laughs> so nice the whole time, <laughs> and I thank you. And um, I really appreciated this. It's a lot to think about. My big question was the same as Amy's. You know, how do you know when a poem's over? I mean, how yeah. do you know? Yeah. And um, I'd love to trade some eggs for some of your bread. <laughs> oh, that would be wonderful. I need to okay. put some on my list too. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Wonderful. I and love bartering. I'm, <laughs> I'm not in town, but I can like pick them up from you or yeah, totally. You know, we or, could. I could come. Somewhere. You're not that far. You're not that far. I'm seven miles west okay. of Main Street Books. <laughs> really? Is that right? Oh, that's so funny. Yes. <laughs> I always think of up the mountain as north, but I guess it's west. It's west, yeah. I'm just <laughs> off of 40. Here's my okay. cat. I'm yeah, hanging yeah. out. <laughs> but thank nice you day. very much. This has been okay, great. Thanks for I've, coming. I'm so I've been meaning you. to come to these, Jen, and I always forget, but here I am today. Thank you. Yay. I'm so Wonderful. glad you made it today. Yeah, glad you made it. <laughs> So apparently the Center for Literary Arts is fostering not just a writerly community, but also a bartering system yes. for blood and eggs. <laughs> Love it. Hey, you got my number. I think that's yes. <laughs> Everybody has my number. <laughs> See, there's an I, example of me like giving to my, I, think I, I don't know, I don't have any boundaries. You get calls from all over the world. Liz, can you trade some bread for uh, something? <laughs> We, we have a lot of cat hair. We're happy to, I, I'm happy to drive it over the mountain to Frostburg to share. Um, that's what I can give you. I have a, a plug-in hybrid now, so I can just go on the battery. I can go seven miles on the battery. <laughs> electric car soon. I really, having this car, it makes me want an electric car because it's the battery so little. I just think, oh my God, why am I, why? I'm, when I finish teaching, I'm going to finish teaching at the end of the fall. I think that's when I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to try to sell it and then get an electric car. Yeah. Yay. Mm. And I won't have to worry about that commute at all. You know, I worry, you know, that's a little bit of a worry. I mean, I think it would be fine, but. Yeah. Range <laughs> anxiety is. Always yeah. Thing. Well, <laughs> we're getting an electric car and we're going to have a plug here. So you'll be yeah. able to charge up when you I can make come it up. When I bring the bread. <laughs> 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 and we're bartering. That sounds great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what kind are you going to get? Do you know yet? We're on the waiting list for a bolt because oh, of the great. battery oh, got recalled. We got it's up in Pennsylvania. We're just waiting for the new battery to be installed, and then we're going to pick it up. Okay. Yay! Yeah, That's I can't great. wait. Cannot wait. Well, I'd love a bolt, but you know, you can't get you can't well you can't get new ones. I, I guess you get used ones. You can get used ones. Yeah. Yeah, we're getting a used one. We I never buy a new car. Do. That's what I might do. I really like those. They're great. They look great to me, and they go pretty far. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They have a good. They have a great range. I think that might be a good car for me. That's something I've been thinking about. I actually got on the order list for a Tesla, but it's just too much. <laughs> Forget it. It's too much money. It's like all my savings. We got a lot it's of money. Yeah. Ridiculous. I can't yeah. do it. And the used ones are all, but um, they cost more. About the same. They cost more. Some of them know, more, more that's yes. Why, that's why I, I decided to order a new one, but it's like, oh, like every time I work it out, you know, my head, which is like every other day, <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> I can't do it. So I think a bolt would be better for me. It would be, that would be much cheaper. Yeah. You just have to wait. Not, not easy. The waiting is a drag. I know. Yeah. But the sooner you start, <laughs> 
That's true. <laughs> right, right, right. So maybe I should think about that. Yeah. Um, okay. This has been such a joy. So yeah, so I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Yeah. You know this more is- about me now. <laughs> and hopefully once we start uh, meeting in person um, after yeah. the whole you, pandemic is that? over and you, you feel safe. Yeah, let's do that. No, totally. Yeah. I could do it now with a mask. I would do it with a mask. So for like, I, I don't know, Jen, are, is our next coffee in person, right? Our next coffee is in person. Actually, that was just what I was about to pull up. Okay, uh, yes. So on the 2nd of April, we'll have Stephen Burr uh, for Coffee with a Writer in the Center for Literary Arts, which is on the Frostburg State University campus uh, in the Lewis J. Ort Library, though accessed through a separate entrance, uh, room 237. Okay. And then on the 7th of May, uh, and I should say that uh, Stephen Burr is an essayist and an ed- editor. Um, he did his uh, doctoral work at Georgetown, a fascinating fella. Um, so he'll be with us on the 2nd of April. On the, on the 7th of May, Anna Dixon James is going to be with us uh, also in person. And then we do have some other events coming up for the Center for Literary Arts. Um, on the, uh, let's see, 16th of March, so really pretty soon, uh, Zhang Er is going to be reading with us um, also in the Center for Literary Arts. We have a reading by Robert Wood Lynn, a West Virginia poet coming up, I'm sorry, a Virginia poet coming up on the 7th of April. And um, all of our events are listed on the Center for Literary Arts website, uh, which can be accessed, of course, through a simple Google search, but also um, via the FSU website. Uh, So we've got still a long list of events coming up uh, for the rest of the spring semester. And uh, if I can take the opportunity, I guess, just to close up, um, Liz, thank you for being with us uh, and for reading your work and such fascinating uh, commentary. I've got all kinds of notes that I um, was taking while you were speaking uh, just for things to think about. And um, of course, we are always indebted to Nina Forsyth for facilitating these talks. Um, She does such a good job of them. So Nina, thank you. Thank and, you. Mm-hmm. And we look forward to seeing you at other Center for Literary Arts events. Thanks so much. Yes, I look forward to seeing all of you. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks so much, Liz.